All right, this video is going to be on the fascinating poet Amelia Lanier. And we're going to look at two of her works, um, one of which is rather lengthy, so I'm not going to be able to read it all as I am wont to do in the class. And um, that's called Salve Deus Rex Judeorum. Uh, and the second of which is the description of Cookham, which is a country house poem. And uh, we just looked at uh, two pensers from uh, ben Johnson, which is often accredited with being the most influential of the country house poems, and it and it is. But it is interesting to note that uh, Lanier's description of Cookham actually antedates uh, Johnson's efforts, and so it could be seen, um, and to my limited knowledge, it is actually the first of the genre. And, and Lanier is a rather neglected poet, and, but I think she deserves considerable uh, attention. Um, and uh, that's why I put her on the course. I think she is actually very interesting and a good writer um, who sought to make a living for herself as a writer, uh, very unusual for the day, and was unsuccessful in, in her attempts, um, and ended up uh, towards, uh, after that hope of finding a patroness uh, failed, then then started to school and had to abandon her desires to, to be a writer. But those are biographical details. I don't need to get into all of those, but I mean, they're worthy of looking into it a bit more if you are interested. Uh, she's born in 1569, uh, dies in 1645, so she lives to a, a ripe old age. Um, her father was Italian, uh, uh, daughter of Baptist Bassano, um, who was a musician in the English court and uh, ha who had a mistress by the name of Margaret Johnson. So she's born outside of wedlock, scandal there already. Uh, born in Bishopsgate. And uh, it was thought that she was brought up, uh, at least for a time, in the household of Lady Susan, uh, the Countess Dowager of Kent. Uh, her father dies in 1576, so when she is... Uh, seven, um, after financial difficulties, he leaves her a hundred pounds, which is not a small sum of money at the time, but, and her mother dies nine years later. So when she's, uh, 16, so she is without parents at the age of 16 and she becomes, uh, the mistress of, uh, Henry Carey, who's the first Lord, uh, Hunston, uh, who's 45 years older than she, it's part of her financial, uh, duress and also reflects um, obviously the attractiveness of the woman and is made pregnant by him in 1592 uh, and then hastily is married off to one of the queen's musicians to avoid the scandal uh, by the name of captain alfonso lanyer who has 40 pounds a year mr darcy had ten thousand, but uh, there is something of inflation but still 40 pounds a year and she has a son and the son's name is henry and uh, we don't have a lot of details about Lanier's life other from uh, the diary of a astrologer by the name of Simon Foreman, uh, who she consults on occasion. So Lanier, uh, and, and from that diary, we read that <clears throat> uh, Lanier had told him that her husband had dealt hardly with her and spent and consumed her goods, and she is now in debt. And her husband left her on a sea voyage further, um, and, um, and she is in financial duress. Some have suggested she is the dark lady in Shakespeare's uh, sonnets. Um, no particular reason, this is just guesswork, I, I believe, other than that she uh, probably had a darker complexion by English standards and dark hair. And, um, but she circled uh, in the right circles in terms of attaining patronage and uh, accompanies Margaret, uh, the uh, Countess of Cumberland and Anne, Anne Clifford, uh, who's the daughter to uh, Cookham, uh, as I say, the, the site of the country house poem that she writes. But they there, uh, she is inspired to write and the first work that she writes ends up being a collection of poems and um, which uh, is trying to find a patron for herself as a writer. As I say, sadly, she did not receive a patron, but I think the work, which is on the passion of 
Christ um, is worthy and certainly represents a first foray into what we would today call feminist, early feminist uh, attempts at, uh, at authorship and so forth. And I do think it's, as I say, rather impressive. And even more uh, interesting than impressive is the portrait of uh, the reason for the fall uh, or a, 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 a sort of apologetic for Eve and a defense of women in this, uh, which I think makes it rather unique and rather interesting. So, uh, but I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, let me see here. Well, I should say one more thing about Lanier. Um, some think that her father um, had moved uh, from Venice to uh, Henry VIII's court um, to escape the Catholic Inquisition um, because they were Marano Jews um, who were outwardly appearing to be Protestant, but actually practicing uh, Judaism. And um, so there's some sense of, of complexity even there uh, in terms of her background. So very much different than the poets that we're looking at on the course otherwise. Um, now, as I say, uh, salve Deus rex Judeorum, I can't simply, uh, I can't read the entirety of it um, simply because the length forbids it. Uh, but what we have here, and it's in our edition as well, are extracts from that. And what it, it, at the beginning, it is dedicated, as often is the case, particularly by those that are seeking patronage, to various uh, potential patrons. Um, so he, she dedicates one of them to the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, to Lady Elizabeth's Grace, to all virtuous ladies in general. That's what we have in our edition here to Lady Arabella, Lady Susan, Lady Marie, Lady all, all manners of aristocratic women. And all of the, the purpose of this is simply to uh, praise them for their virtue. Uh, so varieties of encomia here. Uh, and then to commend them to the main subject matter of the poem, which is to uh, portray uh, and give to uh, the reader Eve's apology in defense of women. And so that's going to be the focus of my study here is, uh, or at least on this video, is to get the extract from Salve Deus Rex Judeorum uh, and, and have a look at it in some of the main features there, which uh, are rather unique and anticipate modern feminism, but give uh, readings of Eve and the fall and the account of the fall, which remember is the substance of Milton's Paradise Lost and so much uh, essential uh, feature or episode in human history, and to rather give a different take on it. The, the church fathers often, um, in the worst instances, blamed Eve for the fall, um, and in other instances just talked about Eve's uh, weakness and fallibility, as Milton did, uh, greater susceptibility, for which reason the serpent sought him out. Now, uh, Lanier concedes that, uh, women's weakness, but she uses that as a means to uh, exculpate to some degree. I mean, not, not to exculpate, but to assign blame rather elsewhere. If Eve is weak and dependent, that means that the one who is stronger and responsible ought to carry greater responsibility. That's the gist of her take. Let's have a look at uh, this, an extract from, as I say, Salve Deus, Rex Judeorum. And, um, and we'll get to the, the gist of it. <clears throat> and here it is. But surely Adam cannot be excused. For her fault, though great, yet he was most to blame. What weakness offered, strength might have refused. Being Lord of all, the greater was his shame. Although the serpent's craft had her abused, God's holy word ought all his actions frame. For he was Lord and King of all the earth. Before poor Eve had either life or breath, who being framed by God's eternal hand, the perfectest man that ever breathed on earth, and from God's mouth received that straight command, the breach whereof he knew was present death, yea, having power to rule both 
sea and land, yet with one apple, one, to loose that breath which God had breathed in his beauteous face, bringing us all in danger and disgrace. And then to lay the fault on patience back, that we, poor women, must endure it all. We know right well he did discretion lack, not being, being not persuaded thereunto at all. If, if Eve did err, it was for knowledge sake, the fruit being fair persuaded him to fall. No subtle serpent's falsehood did betray him. If he would eat it, who had power to stay him? Not Eve, whose fault was only too much love, which made her taste or give this present to her dear. What That what she tasted, he likewise might prove, whereby his knowledge might become more clear. He never sought her weakness to reprove with those sharp words which he of God did hear. Yet men will boast of knowledge, which he took from Eve's fair hand, as from a learned book. Very interesting. Very interesting take. And take this and compare it and contrast it, if you will, um, to Milton's account of the fall in Paradise Lost, which does assign Adam greater blame. Uh, right from the outset of the Paradise Lost, you can see it's of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. Now, in the account of the fall that we have in Paradise Lost Book 9, we see that Eve does sin first and then gives Adam the forbidden truth, and he is not, as Lanyer herself also emphasizes here, he's not um, deceived. Rather, he does it out of love. Now, this is the same motivation that Lanyer ascribes to Eve in giving him the fruit. I think that Adam, or, or at least Milton, in his depiction, having uh, fallen, Eve, in her uh, weakness, um, is given less charitable motives because the effect of the fruit is immediate on her. And so she is not, as Lanyer would have it, uh, guiltless in handing Adam the forbidden fruit, but he is nonetheless not uh, any less guilty or responsible for having taken it. It's just that Eve's motivations are less um, charitably expressed than Lanyer does here, um, who simply ex excuses her fault as attributed to too much love. Now, well, that is exactly what uh, Milton's Eve says uh, her motivation is, but the reader is given good reason to question that otherwise. But very interesting to me uh, that Lanyer is engaging with this topic and exactly uh, to some degree makes the claim, which is scriptural, that Eve uh, was the weaker vessel. And she's, she's not seeking to contest that. What she is doing, and this also seems correct, is she is attributing the greater blame to the one who is stronger. And it was charged to uh, guide or to guard and to tend the garden, namely Adam, the one to whom God's uh, commandment was given uh, to not eat of the fruit. Uh, and so she engages with this. Now, this is very interesting for all manner of reasons. The poem itself is, is quite good, actually. Um, but it's more the topic and the engagement with it, which to my mind is interesting, at least in the light of the time in which it is written. Remember, this is 1611. This is the same year in which uh, the authorized version of the Bible by King James is published. It's the same year in which many great literary works are published. And uh, it's the, the year in which uh, Amelia Lanyard's poem is published. Uh, and to some degree, it's presenting a defense of women. <clears throat> but of course, uh, so what else comes out? Shakespeare's plays in quarto are published in 1611. Uh, Chapman's translation of Homer's Iliad in verse is, is published. And so is the collected edition, uh, the first one of Edmund Spencer's work. So this is a great period of literary achievement, the early 17th century. And Lanyard herself uh, contributed to that, sadly, again, without a patron, despite the women that he, she wrote to and received some support from, not sufficient for her to be an independent female author. Uh, nonetheless, I think we can see considerable talent there. And in Rex uh, Salve Deus, Rex Judeorum, a, uh, a meditation on 
uh, on the fall. And we don't get any sense that this is recognized in her lifetime. She doesn't get a patron. Uh, the response is rather underwhelming. Uh, but in the light of historical context, uh, people and scholars will see it as having a very important place in the history of English literature. Um, so groundbreaking, if you want to see a, an inheritance for feminist scholarship and, and a literary tradition and, and for poetry. And I think, although the poem was forgotten for centuries, it is, it is uh, worthy of reading, and I've put it on the course for that reason. But I, as I say, I'm, I can't do the entirety of it and read it just simply because it is simply too long. Uh, but there is, uh, I think there's not, there's not inconsiderable skill being used in this uh, poem. Um, and uh, I think I've given you some reason for that. Let me move on to this country house poem, which she writes. And as I say, is the first country house poem, even uh, preceding Johnson's to Penshurst, let alone Marvell's on Appleton House. So it's a genre of literature which uh, attains uh, considerable uh, following and estimation amongst uh, the more renowned poets of the day. I say Johnson and Marvell are great poets onto their, uh, on their own right. But Lanier is the um, pioneer of this type of poem. So that uh, also uh, merits our uh, consideration. It's the description of Cookham. Let me read it. It's not short, but it's also not so long as Salve Deum. Um, so the description of Cookham. Farewell, sweet Cookham, where I first obtained grace from that grace where perfect grace remained, and where the muses gave their full consent. I should have power the virtuous to content, where princely palace willed me to indict the sacred story of the soul's delight. Farewell, sweet place, where virtue then did rest and all delights did harbor in her breast. Never shall my sad eyes again behold those pleasures which my thoughts did then unfold. Yet you, great lady, mistress of that place from whose desires did spring this work of grace, vouchsafe to think upon those pleasures past as fleeting worldly joys that could not last, or as dim shadows of celestial pastures, which are desired above all earthly treasures. Oh, how me thought against you that there came, each part did seem some new delight to frame. The house received all ornaments to grace it and would endure no foulness to deface it. And walks put on their summer liveries and all things else did hold like similes. The trees with leaves, with fruits, with flowers clad, embraced each other, seeming to be glad, turning themselves to beauteous canopies to shade the bright sun from your brighter eyes. The clear crystal streams with silver spangles graced, while by the glorious sun they were embraced. The little birds in chirping notes did sing to entertain both you and that sweet spring. In Philo Philomela with her sundry lays, both you and that sweet place did praise. Oh, how me thought, each plant, each flower, each tree set forth their beauties then to welcome thee. The very hills right humbly did descend when you to tread on them did intend. And as you set your feet, they still did rise, glad that they could receive so rich a prize. The gentle winds did take delight to be among those woods that were so graced by thee. And in sad murmur, uttered pleasing sound, that pleasure in that place might more abound. The swelling banks delivered all their pride. When such a phoenix once they had espied, each arbor, bank, each seat, each stately tree, thought themselves honored in supporting thee. The pretty birds would oft come to attend thee, yet fly away for fear they would offend thee. The little creatures in the burrow by would come aboard to sport them in your eye, yet fearful of the bow in your fair hand, would run away when you did make a stand. Now let me come unto that stately tree wherein such goodly prospects you did see. That oak that did in height 
his fellows pass, as much as lofty trees, low lying growing grass, much like a comely cedar, straight and tall, whose beauteous stature far exceedeth all. How often did you visit this fair tree, which seeming joyful in receiving thee would like a palm tree spread his arms abroad, desirous that you there should make abode. Desirous, whose fair green leaves, much like a comely veil, defended Phoebus when he would assail, whose pleasing boughs did yield a cool, fresh air, joying his happiness when you were there, where being seated, you might plainly see hills, vales, and woods as if on bended knee they had appeared, your honor to salute, or to prefer some strange unlooked for suit, all interlaced with brooks and crystal springs, a prospect fit to please the eyes of kings. And 13 shires appeared all in your sight. Europe could not afford much more delight. What was there then but gave you all content while you the time in meditation spent of their creator's power, which there you saw in all his creatures held a perfect law. And in their beauties did you plain descry his beauty, wisdom, grace, love, majesty. In these sweet woods, how often did you walk with Christ and his apostles there to talk, placing his holy writ in some fair tree to meditate what you therein did see. With Moses you did mount his holy hill to know his pleasure and perform his will. With lowly David you did often sing his holy hymns to heaven's eternal king. And in sweet music did your soul delight to sound his praises morning, noon, and night. With blessed Joseph you did often feed your pined brethren when they stood in need. And that sweet lady sprung from Clifford's race of noble Bedford's blood, fair stem of grace, to honorable Dorset, now espoused, in whose fair breast true virtue then was housed. Oh, what delight did my weak spirits find in those pure parts of her well-framed mind. And yet it grieves me that I cannot be near unto her whose virtues did agree with those fair ornaments of outward beauty, which did enforce from all both love and duty, unconstant fortune, thou art most to blame, who cast us down into so low a frame where our great friends we cannot daily see. So great a difference is there in degree. Many are placed in those orbs of state, partners in honor, so ordained by fate, nearer in show, yet farther off in love, in which the lowest always are above. But whither am I carried in conceit? My wit too weak to conster of the great. Why not? Although we are but born of earth, we may behold the heavens, despising death. And loving heaven that is so far above may in the end vouchsafe us entire love. Therefore, sweet memory, do thou retain those members' pleasures past, which will not turn again. Remember beauteous Dorset's former sports so far from being touched by ill reports, wherein myself did always bear a part, while reverend love presented my true heart, those recreations let me bear in mind, which her sweet youth and noble thoughts did find. Whereof deprived I evermore must grieve, hating blind fortune, careless to relieve, and you, sweet Cookham, whom these ladies leave, I now must tell the grief you did conceive at their departure, when they went away, how everything retained a sad dismay. Nay, long before, when once an inkling came, methought each thing did unto sorrow frame. The trees that were so glorious in our view forsook both flowers and fruit, when once they knew of your depart. Their very leaves did wither, changing their colors as they grew together. But when they saw this had no power to stay you, they often wept, though speechless, could not pray you, letting their tears in your fair bosoms fall as if they said, why will you leave us all? This being vain, they cast their leaves away, hoping that pity would have made you stay. Their frozen tops like ages hoary airs, hoary hairs shows their disasters languishing in fears, 
a swarthy, riveled rind all over spread their dying bodies, half alive, half dead. But your occasions called you so away that nothing there had power to make you stay. Yet did I see a noble, grateful mind requiting each according to their kind, forgetting not to turn and take your leave of these sad creatures, powerless to receive your favor. Then when with grief you did depart, placing their former pleasures in your heart, giving great charge to noble memory, there to preserve their love continually, but especially the love of that fair tree, that first and last you did vouchsafe to see, in which it pleased you oft to take the air with noble Dorset, then of a virgin fair, where many a learned book was read and scanned, to this fair tree, taking me by the hand, you did repeat the pleasures which had passed, seeming to grieve, they could no longer last. And with a chaste yet loving kiss took leave, of which sweet kiss I did it soon bereave, scorning a senseless creature could possess so great a favor, <clears throat> so great happiness. No other kiss it would receive from me for fear to give back what it took of thee. So I, ungrateful creature, did deceive it of that which you in love vouchsafe to leave it. And though it oft had given me much content, yet this great wrong I never could repent. But of the happiest made it most forlorn, to show that nothing's free from fortune's scorn. While all the rest with this most beauteous tree made their sad consort sorrows harmony. The flowers that on the banks and walks did grow, crept in the ground, the grass did weep for woe. The winds and waters seemed to chide together because you went away, they knew not whither. And those sweet brooks that ran so fair and clear with grief and noble trouble wrinkled did appear. Those pretty birds that wanted were to sing, now neither sing nor chirp nor use their wing but with their tender feet on some bare spray, warble forth sorrow and their own dismay. Fair Philomela leaves her mournful ditty drowned in deep sleep, yet can procure no pity. Each arbor bank, each seat, each stately tree looks bare and desolate now for want of thee. Turning green tresses into frosty gray, while in cold grief they wither all away. The sun grew weak, his beams no comfort gave, when all green things did make the earth their grave. Each briar, each bramble, when you went away, caught fast your clothes, thinking to make you stay. Delightful echo wanted to reply to our last words, did now for sorrow die. The house cast off each garment that might grace it, putting on dust and cobwebs to deface it. All desolation then there did appear when you were going, whom they held so dear. This last farewell to cook him here I give. When I am dead, thy name in this may live, wherein I have performed her noble hest whose virtues lodge in my unworthy breast, and ever shall, so long as life remains, tying my life to her by those rich chains. So a rather lengthy poem, I apologize for reading it in its full. It's very, it would be very difficult for me to cut um, um, extracts from it. And so I took longer than I normally would. But we can see many of the features uh, of that we saw in Johnson's to Penshurst here. We have something like the great chain of being, uh, which I've mentioned already at the outset of the course and the Elizabethan uh, world view or world picture being portrayed here in the uh, connection of, 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 uh, of all things to one another, but also a matter of degree. And she being uh, Amelia Lanier is not worthy to be have her place here. And there's a there's a great deal more self consciousness and self referential language in this poem than there would be in the case of Johnson. In the case of Johnson, the focus really is on the house and really is on what the house represents. Whereas the topos of the house in a Lanyard's uh, version of this is the vehicle for her to express her sorrow. And the sorrow is fitly 
expressed in terms of the season that is depicted, which is namely that of the, the fall, the autumn, and perhaps even the onset of winter, which leads her to mourning and lament. So the female version, or at least Lanyard's version of the country house poem is one that does not emphasize as Johnson's did the, the perpetual spring of Penshurst and the earthly paradise, which is here kept in order by its great patron, uh, the Sydneys. It's rather a vehicle for Lanyard to express her sense of alienation from the world. The promise of Eden, which she has been uh, not expelled from, but is now moved away from because her difference of degree. So it's a very much more of a vehicle for a self-conscious poem and a, to some degree, poem of lament. Uh, very much at odds with the tradition of, of eclogues and pastoral poetry. So, in, and in that sense, probably more like if you want to see a, a poem in the, a similar sort of vein, then read Keats's To Autumn. Um, although even there, he's going to see a richness in autumn uh, of harvest that we don't see in Lanier. Lanier, for Lanier, the natural array and all that it represents in its perfection is the cause of sorrow and grief on her part, because again, she is not really welcome there other than for a brief time. But there's almost a, there's a sense of sorrow and regret her on her behalf in the poem, probably fitting her situation from what we know about her biography. All the same, a, a great poem, um, I don't think it's uh, as, as great as Johnson's Two Pens Hers, but it is certainly worthy of study. And I thought it provided a little something different to uh, the main course material. I hope you have found it beneficial. Um, as I say, there are many of the same uh, elements that we see in Johnson's Pen Hers. There's references to classical uh, uh, mythology echo there. Um, uh, to various uh, other um, figures, uh, but also uh, more than in Johnson's case, biblical uh, story and reference to the tree. And here, uh, an Eve-like figure reading from the book of uh, God's word and precedence sat there. So by setting the tree, the trees that higher in the midst of this, there's maybe an oblique reference to the tree in the Garden of Eden that Eve lost but now the new Eve, and perhaps this is being uh, suggested, um, the Countess is uh, presenting to us. So there is an element of paradise restored here in the portrait, and yet at the same time, the attention, and because of the emphasis on, on fall and autumn and winter, um, has the overall uh, sense of, of lament and loss, which it makes it for a good foil to Johnson's two pens hers. And with that, I conclude my thoughts, such as they are. <laughs>